Hey guys, today we're going to be dealing with argument construction and I'm going to be going through three techniques to help you with argument construction that I believe in conjunction can create a basic argument, create depth to that argument and then create significance on specific levels of that argument. So something that's important to note is that the best debaters in the world don't say things in particularly complex and inaccessible ways. They present clever and sophisticated ideas in very simple ways that everyone can understand and find compelling. And that should be the priority, saying things as simply as possible so that everyone is convinced. This has a much greater effect on your audience and on your adjudicators than if you say things in very complicated technical ways that people can't really understand. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to be dealing with three techniques. The first is the questioning technique. The second is the fleshing out technique. And the third is the bare bones technique. So onto the first technique, which is the questioning technique. And here what you need to notice is that something is going to be happening. There is a subject to this thing that is happening. So what you need to do is first answer who. That deals with the subject. And there you want to get a clear picture of the subject of the motion. So what you want to do is create a characterization for this person or for this organization that is involved in the motion. The second is what is happening. So you need to explain what is being proposed. Then you say, how is it happening? Is there a specific way that this is being implemented? And then why is it happening? Lastly, you want to understand which comparative you're operating in. So we've done a video about comparatives, but here, even in an argument, you're talking about a circumstance where you're comparing one thing and the other. So just being aware of what the comparative is can make your claims much more realistic because you know what the scenario you're talking about is. And that's particularly important. This should give you a basic outline to any argument. So a subject to an event, the thing that is happening itself, and what you're comparing it to. So once you've done the questioning technique to get your basic argument, you then move on to the fleshing out technique. When fleshing out argumentation, basically what you're trying to do here is create depth and create a large amount of building blocks to work with. So what you want to do is dig down as deep as possible. When you're talking about the questions that you've asked in your basic argument, you then need to subsequently build around those questions. Keep answering the whys of those arguments. A lot of people ask how you know when to stop. Now, you keep building until you reach the point where you think your opponents will agree with you. And that's probably the point at which you've dug down to the sort of premise that can be used within the debate, where everyone in the debate would agree that that thing is true. That's probably where you need to stop because answering the question further won't create active argumentation within the debate. The reason that this is a valuable step is because sometimes people think that things are obvious when they're not particularly, but generating them and putting them down on paper makes you actively think of them. And that's how you find some kind of nuance and depth to arguments. The last idea is a bare bones technique. So what you do here is you think of an argument like a skeleton with flesh on top of it. Those are not of equal importance. So when you look at a skeleton, that is what is actually holding up this entire person. And specifically the spine is what is making this person work. So what we need to do in an argument is find the spine of that argument. What you need to imagine here is that you only have about 30 seconds to prove the argument. If you only had 30 seconds, what would you say? The reason for this is that you will only have seven or eight minutes to convince your adjudicators of something. And so you, in that finite time, you can't be saying everything that you generated with equal importance. You need to understand, firstly, how much you're going to be saying, and secondly, what is most important of that argument. Once you understand what the spine is, you can start building it up and see what's necessary within a finite space of time. So you might have three or four minutes to get an argument across. What makes most sense to put into those three or four minutes? So that gives you a clear idea of what you need to be focusing on. So if you've added something back that is the flesh or the meat of this argument, it might be said in the debate, but it won't be given equal amounts of time to the spine of that argument because that is the most important thing to prove within the debate. Okay, so to understand these three techniques, I'm going to be doing examples to just drive it home. So the first example would be this house would require individuals to pass a test before being allowed to vote in national elections. So the people involved, the subject of this are voters. 
The thing that is happening is that you are creating a test for voting, and the comparative is that it would be writing a test versus not writing a test and just going in to vote. So then to flesh out these aspects, when you look at voters, people currently vote for all kinds of reasons, and they have different aspects that they take into account. What's important here, though, is that the test is telling you some things are not as important as others. So they're saying not all reasons would be taken into account. So a vote is effectively a choice. What do we need for a good choice to happen? We need information, we need a choice freely made, and we need a circumstance where someone has the capacity to understand the choice that they are making. This test specifically focuses on what information people have when they vote. So, what we need to look at is why people would vote and what information they are basing their decision on currently. And realistically, it's a bunch of different factors, right? You might necessarily vote because you have an intricate understanding of the policies that are advocated for from every single party. You might vote because your family has always voted that way and that's part of your political identity by virtue of being within that family. You might vote because you think that the brand of this specific party is good. Now the question is, are all those reasons equally valuable? And what the test says is no. There are certain things that are going to be more valuable than others. If you don't have adequate information about the parties themselves or the policies themselves, you should not be allowed to make this decision because that's what you are actively affecting. So when you're fleshing it out, you would talk about all the reasons that people vote currently, about what you need for choice and how that affects your voting results. When you are then taking out the fluff of an argument, not every single reason that someone votes is equally important. So some reasons are going to be kind of neutral, but what you're trying to create is a distinction between good reasons and bad reasons. So not all of the reasons that people vote are equally valuable to the democratic process. What you get out of that is the spine, that a test specifically tries to distinguish a meaningful vote from a non-meaningful vote based on access to information. And that's kind of where you build the majority of your links that you keep in within your bigger argument. The second example we're going to do is this house believes that attempted and committed crimes should be punished equally. So when you look at the who, you'd be looking at criminals. When you look at what, you'd be talking about both attempted and committed crimes, the criminals involved in those actions being punished equally. So whatever the sentence is for those, they would have to be equal, likely moving up attempted crimes to committed crime sentencing, but either way, those things would be equal. And then why? That's going to be a really important question to answer within this debate. What is the comparative here? The comparative would be punishing attempted and committed crimes unequally because the consequences matter. Now, what you can do in terms of fleshing out is look at the, the different types of crimes that exist and what are typical attempted crimes and what are committed crimes. What is the difference between all of these? Well, the difference is consequences, right? And so when you get into the bare bones of it, when you look at the difference in consequences, your argument should say that the consequences of this are arbitrary and not within the control of the people who try to commit this action. And what you'd focus on there is that the criminal justice system should punish actions that are within the control of individuals. So a reasonable expectation in society is that you don't commit these crimes. At the point at which you have attempted this crime, it doesn't matter whether you were successful or not, you still violated the rules of that society, and that's what the criminal justice system should be taking into account. So that's where you would really focus in, in terms of answering that question. So with those examples, you should get an idea of how to use these three techniques in conjunction. Your questioning technique answers the basics and gives you a core structure to your argument. Your fleshing out generates a lot of content, which then can be a source of great depth to your argument. And lastly, your bare bones creates importance on specific links within your arguments so that you can prioritize them in a valuable way and use your time effectively. I hope that helps. Thanks very much. Bye.